Thomas Alive to Die presents Circuit City. Circuit City was founded by Samuel S. Wurzel, an importer exporter who owned a business in New York. Wurzel had sold his business and was vacationing in Richmond, Virginia, in 1949 when he went to get a haircut and, while chatting with the barber, learned that the first commercial television station in the South would shortly go on the air in Richmond. Learning this, Wurzel got the idea that it would be a good business proposition to open a store to sell television sets, reasoning that sales in the area would increase because of consumer interest in the new station's local broadcasts. Wurzel moved his family to Richmond and opened a store named Wards, an acronym of its founder's family's names, W for Wurzel, A for his son Alan, R for his wife Ruth, D for his son David, and S for his own name, Samuel. In addition, Wurzel took a partner, Abraham L. Hecht. From its base in retailing televisions, Wurzel soon branched out his business, initially called Wards Company, to include other home appliances. Within 10 years, the business had expanded to encompass a chain of four stores, all of which were located in Richmond. Combined sales volume was about $1 million a year. In 1960 Wards started to expand in another direction, as it began to operate licensed television departments within larger discount mass merchandisers in different areas of the country. The company ran television and other audio equipment sales operations in GEM, GES, and GEX stores. In the following year, Wards offered stock to the public for the first time, selling 110,000 shares in the company for $5.375 through a Baltimore stockbroker. In 1962 Wards increased its commitment to customer service by implementing a new service plan that included a free loan of a television set if a customer's television could not be repaired in the home. Two years later, the company opened its fifth television and appliance store, in Richmond's Southside Plaza Shopping Center. This, along with the company's earlier stock offering, signaled a period of quick expansion for the company. In 1965 Wards made its first moves to grow through acquisition. The company purchased the Richmond Carousel Corporation, a discount department store in Richmond, from the TG Stores Company. By taking over this company, Wards moved into the sale of automotive supplies, gasoline, household supplies, clothing, and children's toys, as well as appliances. In addition, in September 1965 Wards purchased Mormick Incorporated, a Delaware company that operated hardware and houseware sales areas in department stores located in the southeast. The following year, Wards opened its sixth Virginia store, this one located in the Walnut Mall Shopping Center in Petersburg. Each of the company's stores featured 5,000 to 8,000 square feet of space in which to display and sell televisions, audio equipment, and other household appliances. With the additional revenue from this facility, company sales reached $23 million. Also in 1966, one of Samuel Wurzel's sons, Alan, a lawyer, returned to Richmond to take a role in the family business, in preparation for eventually taking over the reins from his father. In 1968 Wards offered additional stock to the public, selling 1,700 shares on the American Stock Exchange. With the revenue generated by this offering, in May 1969 the company purchased Custom Electronics Incorporated, an outfit that sold audio and hi-fi equipment. The company owned four stores in the Washington, D.C. area, as well as a mail-order audio supplies operation called Dixie Hi-Fi. It also ran nine stereo departments and department stores located in an area stretching from Mobile, Alabama, to Albany, New York. Five months later, Wards continued its rapid expansion in the mid-Atlantic states by buying the certified TV and appliance company of Virginia Beach, Virginia, which operated three stores in the Tidewater area. The company also opened an additional carousel store in the Richmond area. One month later, Wards branched out from its familiar geographical area and its core business of appliance retailing when it purchased the Mart, located in Indianapolis, Indiana. This company had as one of its major components the tire retailing operations of the Rose Tire Company and its affiliates, but it also sold televisions, appliances, and furniture. In its furthest geographical leap, Wards also signed a contract to operate licensed television departments in Zodi's department stores in Los Angeles. The company's rapid expansion continued in 1970. Wards bought Woodville Appliances Incorporated, which ran five television and appliance stores in Toledo, Ohio. 
Also in the Midwest, it acquired the operations of the Frank Dry Goods Company, which ran a television, appliance, and furniture store in Fort Wayne, Indiana. By this time, Ward's rapid growth had brought it to a new era, and this was symbolized in 1970 by the transfer of power from the founders of the company to a younger generation. Samuel Wurzel, its founder, stepped down as president, although he remained chairman of the board, and Abraham Hecht, his partner, retired. In their stead, Alan Wurzel was named president of the company. Among the first moves made by the new president was the opening of two specialty stores in Richmond, called Sight & Sound, that sold only audio equipment. These outlets were designed to take advantage of the boom in demand for high-tech stereo equipment. In 1972 Alan Wurzel, still president, assumed the responsibilities of Chief Executive Officer of Wards. In an effort to eliminate weaker areas of the company, he closed the Franks of Fort Wayne store that Wards had purchased two years earlier and shut down three stores formerly run by Certified in Virginia. Following this consolidation, the company began to expand in the next year. Five audio stores were opened, three in the east, in Washington DC, Richmond, Virginia, and Charlottesville, Virginia, and two in California. In the following year, Wards began to suffer the adverse effects of its rapid expansion and diversification into areas not related to its core business of television and appliance retailing. In 1974 the company lost $3 million on overall sales of $69 million. In an effort to stem the red ink, Wurzel withdrew Wards from areas in which it was not turning a profit, such as tire sales. In addition, Wards was losing a large amount of money on its licensed appliance departments and three discount department store chains that were doing very badly. To cut its losses, the company began to move out of its leased audio and television operations and department stores, retaining only its involvement in the California Zodi stores. In a shift in direction also occurring in 1974, Wards closed two of its original stores in Richmond, opting instead to risk half the company's net worth opening a $2 million electronics superstore. With this move, Wards began to shift its focus from appliances in general to the growing market in consumer electronics. The company called its pioneering venture the Wards Loading Dock. With 40,000 square feet, the warehouse store displayed and sold a very large selection of video and audio equipment and major appliances. This enormous facility, with its exceptionally broad offerings of more than 2,000 products, enabled Wards to take a strong lead against its competitors. In addition, the Superstore's high volume of sales meant that the company could afford to offer lower prices than its smaller competitors, as well as such amenities as home delivery and in-store repairs. In this way, by locating its stores in medium-sized markets otherwise served only by smaller, mom-and-pop operations, Wards was able to exploit growing consumer interest in new electronics products. The successful Superstore concept became the innovation upon which Wards built its future growth. Also in 1974, Wards expanded its Dixie Hi-Fi line of discount audio stores, adding nine new properties. In the next year, as its Richmond Superstore showed promising returns, Wards began to streamline its operations. The company sold its four Woodville television and appliance stores in Toledo, Ohio, and also shuttered four of its five Mart stores in Indianapolis. In addition, the company shed its two carousel stores in Richmond. Two years later, in 1977, anticipating that the boom in stereo sales would eventually slow, Wards began to broaden the offerings of its Dixie Hi-Fi and Custom Hi-Fi discount audio equipment stores, transforming them into full-service electronic specialty markets. With this new concept, Wards changed the name of the stores to Circuit City, opening six of the new facilities in the Washington, D.C. area. With 6,000 to 7,000 square feet of space, the new stores featured video and audio equipment made by well-known brand names, as well as in-store service capabilities and a pickup area for people to load purchases into their cars. To shift its operations toward the Circuit City concept, Wards continued to streamline in 1978. The company left the mail-order electronics business, which it ran under the name Dixie, and also closed its four Richmond site and sound stores. In the following year, the company continued its progress toward large retail outlets, opening a second Ward's loading dock in Richmond. The company ended 1979 with $120 million in sales. In 1981 Ward's made its first incursion into a significant and challenging new market when it merged with the Lafayette Radio Electronics Corporation, which ran eight consumer electronics stores in the New York City metropolitan area. 
The company paid $6.6 million for the bankrupt retailer, earning $36.5 million in tax credits as a result of the acquisition, a benefit that observers predicted would drive up its own earnings. Lafayette's reputation within the highly competitive New York market was that of a small specialty seller that provided obscure, high-priced brand-name goods to hi-fi hobbyists. Words faced an uphill battle in its struggle to broaden the chain's appeal and return it to profitability, especially since other New York electronics retailers routinely discounted items 50% or permitted haggling over the price of their products. At the same time that Wards moved into the New York market, the company began to expand its loading dock superstore concept in the geographical areas where it already had a presence. Capitalizing on its other name, the company christened its new outlet Circuit City Superstores. The first four stores under this name opened in Raleigh, Greensboro, Durham, and Winston-Salem, North Carolina. In the following year, Wards simplified the naming of its outlets by changing the names of its Richmond Wards loading dock stores to Circuit City Superstores. By 1982 Wards was operating four retail chains, including Circuit City Stores, larger Circuit City Superstores, its Lafayette properties in New York, and its operations in Zodi Discount Stores in California. Altogether, the company ran 100 outlets, twice the number it had owned just seven years earlier. A total of 80% of Wards' revenue was derived from sales of consumer electronics, and the company reaped solid profits from its marketing of Sony Betamax video cassette recorders, VCRs, and Pioneer stereo equipment. In Washington, D.C., Ward Circuit City stores held the largest market share, garnering 11% of the sales of consumer electronics. By the end of 1983, Ward's pattern of consistent growth through emphasis on large retail outlets had led to sales of $246 million for the fiscal year. As a sign of its shifting identity, Ward's changed its corporate name to Circuit City Stores Incorporated in 1984. Also in this year, its stock was listed on the New York Stock Exchange for the first time. Although the leadership of the company changed hands Alan Wurzel stepped up to the post of chairman of the board, to be succeeded by Richard Sharp its basic direction did not. Sharp's background was in computers, not retailing, and he had first come into contact with Circuit City when he installed a computer system to control sales and inventory in some of its stores. Under Sharp, the company continued to consolidate its operations in very large stores, replacing regular Circuit City stores with Circuit City Superstores. This process began in Knoxville, Tennessee, Charleston, South Carolina, and Hampton, Virginia. These stores, some of which contained nearly an acre of floor space, used their grand scope to bring a theatrical flair to retailing consumer electronics. The stores featured solid walls of television sets, all tuned to the same channel. Customers entered by walking past the service department, a visible symbol that the company serviced what it sold. The stores were laid out like baseball diamonds, and customers were led around the displays by a red tile walkway. Particularly popular items were located at the back of the store, to encourage impulse purchasing on the way. By 1984 Circuit City was operating 113 stores, which made it the leading specialty retailer of brand-name consumer electronics. The company's growth continued briskly, fed by innovative new electronics products such as cordless telephones, microwave ovens, and VCRs, for which initial demand was high. Its superstores contributed the largest part of its earnings, while the New York operations continued to lose money. To fuel continued growth, Circuit City further expanded its operations. In 1984 the company planned a large expansion around Atlanta and opened 15 new stores in Florida. In locating stores, Circuit City adhered to a policy of clustering them together in the same area, which allowed for economies of scale. In 1986 Circuit City took the final step in consolidating its operations. The company closed down its 15 unprofitable stores in the New York area, run under the Lafayette name, after a five-year, $20 million struggle to crack this tough market. In addition, Circuit City withdrew from its arrangement with the 50-store Zodi's discount department store chain in California. This low-rent retailer, which had long been suffering financial troubles, provided an inhospitable home to Circuit City's operations and contributed no earnings to its bottom line. Instead, the company decided to put the resources previously used to run these operations into further Circuit City superstores, concentrating expansion in the Southeast and in California, where it planned to open its own freestanding stores. In moving into a new area, Circuit City methodically set out to win the lion's share of sales in that market. The company typically opened a large number of very large stores all at once, advertised heavily, and distributed products efficiently. 
These efforts bore fruit in February 1987, when Circuit City's annual sales hit the $1 billion mark for the first time, driven in large part by the demand for VCRs, which also pushed up demand for new televisions and other audio equipment. The company faced a challenging future, however, as demand for this core product cooled and competition from other electronic superstores heated up. Despite these adverse circumstances, by 1988 the company owned 105 stores, 32 of which were located in California. Armed with the nation's largest market share, Circuit City planned to add 20 new outlets. Among these new outlets were several that featured a new format. Called Impulse, these stores were tested by the company in Baltimore, Maryland, Richmond, Virginia, and McLean, Virginia. These stores, designed for malls, sold small electronic products for personal use or to be given as gifts. Three years later, the company announced that its test of this concept had been successful, and that it planned to open 50 more such outlets. By 1989 Circuit City's profits had tripled in just three years to reach $69.5 million, despite a general recession in the consumer electronics retailing industry. Observers attributed the company's success to strong management and a merchandising formula that had been honed and refined for many years. That formula was adjusted further in 1989 when Circuit City began opening mini superstores and markets too small for a full-fledged massive outlet. Claiming that the mini store offered the same service and selection as a larger outlet, the company opened a test site in Asheville, North Carolina. By the following year, sales overall had hit $2 billion, and earnings were up as well. In the meantime, the company's superstores expanded their product array, offering personal computers for the first time in 1989 and recorded music in 1992. Circuit City surged ahead in the early 1990s, with strong sales growth and steady expansion into new markets. By 1994 it had close to 300 stores and had plans to open almost 200 more. But growing competition, particularly with the similar electronic superstore chain Best Buy, caused the company to fight harder for market share and to search for new ways to make money. In late 1993, Circuit City announced it would cut prices in markets it shared with Best Buy, sparking a grueling price war. The firm differed from Best Buy in offering a high-service, hard-sell sales environment, with salespeople working for commission. Best Buy was more of a help-yourself retailer. Circuit City publicly defended its more aggressive style, broadcasting the results of a survey in 1994 that claimed that consumers preferred its level of service. By 1995, half its stores were in markets shared by Best Buy, and 70% of its markets were classified by analysts as highly competitive. Despite the competition, Circuit City had sales of about $7 billion by 1995, and sales and earnings were rising by 20% annually. The company went in a new direction in 1993, opening the first of what became a chain of used car lots. Two years later, Circuit City was trumpeting its new chain, CarMax. Circuit City CEO Sharp moved the company into used cars because he saw that the existing market was lucrative, fragmented, and not well run. Customers hated the haggling and distrusted salespeople, as a rule, in the traditional used car lot. CarMax offered a huge, clean lot of cars marked with barcodes so that customers could easily locate the vehicles in which they were interested from a central computer listing. Prices were fixed, so the dreadful bargaining was out. CarMax lots held 500 to 1,000 cars, all no more than 5 years old, and with less than 70,000 miles on them. Each car went through a 110-point inspection, and CarMax offered a 30-day warranty. The aim was to bring Circuit City's retailing experience into this new industry and make the buying process easier on the customer. Though Circuit City was cautious about releasing sales figures for its first CarMax stores, one analyst estimated that its Richmond, Virginia, lot was bringing in about $55 million after being open one year. By 1996 there were five CarMax outlets, and one year later Circuit City sold a 25% stake in CarMax through an IPO that raised nearly $415 million and created a CarMax tracking stock. Circuit City retained 75% of the used car retailer. Used car seemed like an odd leap for an electronics retailer, yet it was clear Circuit City needed something to keep it going, as the electronics market became saturated. Best Buy passed up Circuit City during fiscal 1996 and won the title of number one electronics retailer, and competition between the rivals did not let up. In 1998 Circuit City trotted out a new product, a digital movie disc called DivX, hoping to get in on a ground floor technology. DivX was pitched to Circuit City by a Los Angeles legal firm, and Circuit City threw money at it. 
DivX originally stood for Digital Video Express, but it soon became known just by the acronym. It was a disc digitally encoded with a movie, and consumers could purchase it for between $4 and $5, watch the movie within 48 hours, and then throw it away. DivX players were hooked by phone line to a central computer, which registered when the movie was watched, and billed the customer an additional $3 if the disc was used after the initial two-day period. It competed directly with another digital movie format called DVD, which were discs offered for rent, like traditional video cassette movies. Both these technologies were struggling for consumers' attention, with each format offering only a few hundred titles as they rolled out in the fall of 1998. The large video rental chains refused to sell DivX discs, fearing they would undermine their business, and only Circuit City and another chain called Good Guys initially sold DivX. By fiscal 1999 Circuit City was enjoying strong sales in its core electronics business helping push revenues past the $10 billion mark but its used car and DivX ventures were not doing well. CarMax lost $23.5 million in 1998, on sales of $1.5 billion. The chain had grown to more than 30 locations, but Circuit City CEO Sharp halted further expansion in 1999, as sales declined. Competition with a copycat chain, AutoNation, had left CarMax struggling. Some new stores were way too big, and advertising costs were heavy. By 1999 DivX, too, seemed to have lost out to the competition. An estimated 10,000 retailers were selling DVD discs, the reusable digital movies that could either be rented like movies on video or purchased for about $20. Only about 740 of these 10,000 retailers also dealt with DivX, and most of these retailers were actually Circuit City stores. Both Sony's film studios and Warner Brothers declared they would not make their movies available on DivX, and the technology seemed to be getting squeezed out. In June 1999 Circuit City surrendered, pulling the plug on the venture after having invested $233 million to develop and promote the new product. It also took a $114 million after-tax charge for the first quarter of fiscal 2000. In July 1999, meantime, Circuit City launched its e-commerce website, which allowed customers to order products online for both delivery and store pickup. Customers could also return online purchased items at the nearest store. In June 2000 W. Allen McCullough was promoted from President and COO of Circuit City to President and CEO. Sharp remained Chairman for two more years, whereupon McCullough took on that post as well. The first years of the McCullough era brought a host of changes to the company. Just one month after he was named CEO, Circuit City announced it would stop selling appliances in favor of a pure focus on consumer electronics. The company's stores had generated 14% of their overall sales from appliances, but the appliance sector became less appealing after Home Depot Incorporated and Lowe's Companies Incorporated aggressively entered the category and proceeded to engage in pricing battles. In connection with this category exit, Circuit City closed six distribution centers and eliminated 1,000 jobs. At the same time, the company began a three-year, $1.2 billion overhaul of its more than 570 stores. In addition to eliminating the appliances and boosting the selection of hot sellers such as DVD movies, video games, and digital cameras, the remodeled stores were more self-service and consumer-friendly taking a page from the Best Buy formula for success. The new format cut back on the amount of space taken up by the store's warehouse section, where most of the products had previously been stored, inaccessible to customers without the intervention of a salesperson. Circuit City outlets now had more floor space, with more products available for customers to pick up themselves and take to a checkout for purchase. The stores had a more open format, with wider aisles, as well as shopping carts and baskets for customers to use. Although salespeople remained on commission, a practice abandoned by Best Buy in 1989 they took a less aggressive approach than before. As this revamp was rolled out chainwide, Circuit City was hurt by a weak retail environment and strong competition, particularly by the ever-expanding Best Buy. While Circuit City's core business struggled, CarMax had turned solidly profitable. The company took this opportunity to once again focus solely on consumer electronics, spinning off the used car retailer in October 2002 as a separately traded, independent entity called CarMax Incorporated. McCullough continued his efforts at revitalizing the chain in 2003. The key initiative that year was the elimination of commissions at its stores as Circuit City adopted a single hourly pay structure chain-wide. It dismissed 3,900 commissioned salespeople and replaced them with 2,100 hourly employees. 
In addition to reducing annual operating costs by as much as $130 million, eliminating commissions furthered the move toward a more self-approach in the stores. Circuit City's continued weak position was highlighted that year when the owner of CompUSA Inc., operator of computer superstores, made a bid to acquire the company for about $1.5 billion. The Circuit City Board of Directors rejected the proposal in June 2003. Continuing to shed non-core operations, Circuit City sold its bank card finance operation to Fleet Boston Financial Corporation in November 2003 for $1.3 billion. Connected with this sale was an after-tax loss of $90 million. The company also closed 19 underperforming superstore locations in early 2004, taking an additional after-tax charge of $35 million. For the fiscal year ending in February 2004, overall sales fell 2% to $9.75 billion. With the company's more than 600 stores barely profitable, and the $125 million in charges, Circuit City posted a net loss for the year of $89.3 million. In 2004 Circuit City worked to open 65 to 70 new stores its most aggressive plan of expansion in a decade. About half of these would be relocations, the company was trying to eliminate outlets that were sited in less than ideal locations and some of the older stores with huge warehouse space that made remodeling too expensive. During the spring of 2004 Circuit City completed two acquisitions, Music Now Incorporated, an online digital music store, and Intertan Incorporated Circuit City spent about $300 million for Intertan, a firm based in Barrie, Ontario. That operated more than 980 retail stores and dealer outlets in Canada under the Radio Shack, Rogers Plus, and Battery Plus names. In addition to gaining a retailing foothold in Canada, and setting the stage for the possible expansion of the Circuit City chain north of the border, this deal was also designed to help Circuit City expand its offerings of private label products at its U.S. stores. Plans were made to begin rolling out Intertan private label products into Circuit City Superstores in the fall of 2004. Fort Worth, Texas-based Radio Shack Corporation had spun off in Turtan in 1987. Not done with its wheeling and dealing, Circuit City sold its private label credit card operation to Bank One Corporation in May 2004 for approximately $400 million. Despite all these moves, the prime challenge confronting Circuit City remained the same, returning its core U.S. superstore operation to robust profitability while operating within one of the most ruthlessly competitive sectors of the retail market. In 2007, a new 20,000-square-foot store format was introduced as the city and designed to eliminate previously underutilized space. The smaller format gave the company greater flexibility to enter new markets and backfill existing ones. Most new store openings in 2008 used this new store format. On February 8, 2007, Circuit City announced that it planned to close seven domestic superstores and a Kentucky distribution center to cut costs and improve its financial performance. News reports also mentioned that 62 stores in Canada were to close. Circuit City announced on February 23, 2007, that its chief financial officer, Michael Foss, would leave the company. This unsettled investors and analysts concerned about management turnover. This represents the third departure of a senior executive in the past six months, and the second departure of a top five executive in the past month said Goldman Sachs analyst Matthew Fassler in a client note. Chief Executive Officer Phil Schooniver's handpicked team is turning over faster than we would like to see in a turnaround situation. In 2007, the starting wage for new employees was dropped from $8.75 an hour down to $7.40 an hour $6.55 being the federal minimum wage at the time. In a press release on March 28, 2007, Circuit City announced that in a wage management decision in order to cut costs, it had laid off approximately 3,400 better paid associates and would restaff the positions at the lower market-based salaries. Laid-off associates were provided severance and offered a chance to be rehired after 10 weeks at prevailing wages. The Washington Post reported interviews with management concerning the firings. The Post later reported in May 2007 that the layoffs, and consequent loss of experienced sales staff, appeared to be backfiring and resulting in slower sales. In April 2008, video rental firm Blockbuster announced a bid worth $1 billion to purchase Circuit City. In July 2008, Blockbuster withdrew its offer due to market conditions. 
In August 2008, the chain's head office demanded stores destroy all copies of an issue of Mad Magazine which described Sucker City as a chain with a long list of locations, all in proximity to each other and each adjacent to a rival Best Buy store. Philip J. Schooniver, CEO, President and Chairman of the Board of Circuit City Stores Inc. announced his immediate resignation on September 22, 2008. James A. Markham, former Vice Chairman of the Board, was named Acting CEO. Alan King was selected Chairman of the Board. This switch was said to be due to a stream of losses stemming from the rapid decline of flat panel TV prices, and possibly due to the strong call for Schooniver's removal from activist shareholder Mark Waddles. On November 4, 2008, Circuit City announced that it would close 155 stores and lay off 17% of its workforce by the end of the year as a result of continuing difficulties and remaining profitable. On November 7, 2008, Circuit City laid off between 500 and 800 corporate employees from its Richmond, Virginia headquarters. The approximately 1,000 remaining corporate employees were consolidated into one building in an effort to further reduce costs and improve profitability. On November 10, 2008, Circuit City filed for bankruptcy protection under Chapter 11 of the United States Bankruptcy Code in the United States Bankruptcy Court for the Eastern District of Virginia. At that time, Circuit City stock traded well below $1 per share, and was removed from listing on the New York Stock Exchange. In bankruptcy court, Circuit City was approved to borrow $1.1 billion to finance operations while restructuring. Court filings revealed that the company had assets of $3.4 billion and debt of $2.32 billion, including a $119 million debt to Hewlett Packard and a $116 million debt to Samsung Electronics. Chief Executive James A. Markham promised that the stores would stay open and the chain would not be liquidated. On November 18, 2008, it was announced that Ricardo Salinas Pliego, current owner of Mexican television broadcaster TV Azteca and electronics store chain Electra, had purchased 28% of Circuit City. On January 10, 2009, it was announced by a company spokesman that Circuit City needed a buyer by January 16, 2009, to keep from shutting its doors due to an approaching deadline set by the court and creditors. Although two unnamed parties were interested in buying out Circuit City, a bidder could not be found, so Circuit City, with bankruptcy court approval, converted its Chapter 11 bankruptcy to Chapter 7, and started airing going out of business commercials, as they started closing all of their stores. The Canadian operations, which were run under the source by Circuit City banner, were not initially affected by the liquidation, but were later sold to Bell Canada. I'll go look at the stereos. I could have bought a better TV. Aw, oh, come on, dear, we came to see a stereo. I could have bought a better TV. Well, the department store didn't have that one. I could have bought a better TV. For less. For less! Should have gone to Circuit City. With Circuit City's vast selection of brand name audio, video, and appliances, and guaranteed low prices, you'll never be sorry. I could have bought a better TV. Circuit City, the intelligent choice. If you have any fond memories, please indicate it at the comments below. Thanks for watching, subscribe and like.